looks like we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six committee members, so we can uh, go ahead and get going. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, so the first item that we have on the agenda, um, we have three, well, two guests and one, one um, uh, honorary committee, a non-voting committee member <laughs> with us tonight from the university. Um, so at the last meeting, uh, Tony Maroulis had said that he would reach out to Henry Rensky and Steve Schreiber um, from the university, thinking that in their respective um, areas of expertise, that they might be interested in assisting us with um, some sort of a visioning uh, project um, having to do specifically with, you know, uh, we talked about the Route 9 corridor, although I suppose we could um, make it what we wanted. But um, so certainly Steve and Henry appreciate both of you uh, taking time out um, tonight to join us. Um, would uh, Tony, do you want to introduce them or? Sure. Um, since, you know, I'll do this in my non-voting capacity as a, as a member of this committee. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, you know, as we discussed in the last couple of meetings, uh, my role here is kind of uh, in line with um, what's in our strategic partnership agreement between the university and the town of Hadley. Um, we work together on a number of joint projects. Um, and particularly of interest uh, has been, you know, have been issues around economic development and housing. Not necessarily that, you know, um, uh, in any way in which the university might be, uh, you know, trying to move a needle in any direction, but but certainly in, in ways that we can help, right? As, as the second largest employer in Hampshire County, um, I mean, in, I'm sorry, in the Pioneer Valley and the largest employer in Hampshire County, um, you know, we are... Um, you know, we do work very closely with our host communities and Hadley is one as a, a part of our campus, 28% of our landmass is in Hadley. So um, so we have long, a long partnership. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that Molly had asked prior to my joining the committee is, you know, maybe how we can help. Um, and I think some of that is um, creating connections between our um, faculty and committees like this are faculty with great expertise um, and, uh, you know, in, in some cases, the willingness to help uh, in, in thinking through some of the municipal issues that, that you all might be facing. So um, as discussed the last couple of meetings, we were talking about the potential uh, visioning of uh, Route 9. Um, and, and thinking about what that might look like from um, an adaptive reuse perspective uh, around the mall. Again, this is just an exercise. There, there's, no, uh, there's nothing more than that. Um, and so uh, I reached out to a few colleagues over uh, in both architecture and landscape architecture and regional planning. Um, I'll introduce Steve first because his picture is up on the screen, but um, Steve Schreiber is with us. He is the chair of the Department of Architecture um, and uh, has long been involved in planning uh, issues in the town of Amherst. Um, and then also Henry Rensky, who just popped off for a second, who is a professor in landscape architecture and regional planning and also the director for the, uh, of the Center for Economic Development. Um, I've given uh, both of the gentlemen uh, some updates on kind of what everyone is thinking, although uh, also told them that this there are not a lot of specifics in this ask or this presentation. Uh, and so I will leave it to them to kind of take it away um, with the knowledge they have about, you know, what we're thinking here. So Steve, I'll pass the baton off to you. Yeah, um, so I won't speak all that long other than to say that we're super excited about the prospect of this. So I've talked to Tony about this, but then also to Justin, you know, really, um, and as I understand it, the, the interest is in how, what is possibly a higher and better use of the area near the malls that might include housing. So when Tony and I were talking, it was around the same time a, um, an article came out in the New York Times that actually said, talked about different examples around the country where malls were be, being um, converted to, you know, to mixed use, which, typically means housing plus retail. 
But also in Massachusetts, we have kind of a long history of this, these sorts of conversions. I think most famously Mashpee Commons out on Cape Cod was a really er early example of how an, um, really an old shopping center was converted basically into the town center for a particular part of Mashpee. Mashpee. And that's a, that's a wonderful case study. So specifically talking about the Department of Architecture and how we might be involved. I think the most obvious way is through studios that, so studios are the core of architecture education and actually landscape architecture education that Henry can talk about, but also to a, to a degree, um, regional planning education. So they're, they really kind of mock what students might be doing in practice. And they range in scale from small buildings to urban design plans. So we, we have worked, we just architecture have worked with various communities this way. Um, most recently, the, the town of Irvington on Route 2, but also the towns of Westfield. We've worked in Springfield. We've worked really all up and down the, you know, throughout Western Mass. Sometimes we do this in collaboration with, uh, we have a joint landscape architecture studio with architecture. And this is a, um, a graduate studio that Erica Zikas, if she joins us tonight, has often taught. So that, that would be one way that we could be involved. Another way we could be involved is through a funded research project, which is a, which is, um, a way that we gather a group of faculty and students that are basically acting almost like a, a firm, but acting within the university context. And then another way that I had talked to Tony about is through trying to encourage some students to take this on as a thesis project. And so I mentioned that in part because I, when I taught at the University of New Mexico, one of my students did almost exactly this for a very similar case in Albuquerque of trying to basically bring new life into mall areas by creating town centers. So I'll leave it at that. I'm, I um, turn it over to Henry, happy to answer questions after, after Henry talks. Thanks, Steve. Sorry, I shut off my video when I'm not talking because I have like kids and stuff and they're gonna be running around in the background. We'll be distracting for you. And also a very aggressive cat. Um, yeah, so so um, in regional planning, it operates fairly similarly to the way that that Steve described. As far as you know, um, we do a lot of community projects. Um, we work quite extensively with individual communities um, around the Pine Valley and sometimes further. Um, one of the ways that we do that is through our studio. So we don't have. Um, you know, our, uh, the, the planning curriculum um, has one studio a year, as opposed to the landscape architecture program, which has many studios every semester. And, you know, those studios have themes. And so, you know, I'm representing the department right now, but most of my experience is with the regional planning side. But I can say that both sides of our department, both landscape architecture and planning, um, do community projects. It's just, it depends on, you know, if you're looking at something more that kind of site scale and lower, you know, people looking at things like green infrastructure or, you know, kind of the designs around, you know, possible buildings or visioning um, in that sense. And it might be more of a landscape architecture type of studio. Um, if you're interested in things that are a little bit broader and things that often have kind of a scenario development um, and public outreach and engagement, and maybe some needs assessment, then those are the kind of things that we tend to take on for planning studios. And I sent a link in the chat that gives you um, an example of our most recent planning studio that we did for the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority. And you can see it's really, you know, our students working, helping to design, you know, helping working with PVTA with kind of their long-term strategic planning, helping them do some visioning and helping them understand kind of the, the needs of, um, you know, their constituent communities going forwards and then helping them kind of identify, you know, some possible scenarios that they might want to, um, you know, that they might want to pursue. Um, so the planning studios, um, like I said, we do those once a year. There's, you know, the landscape architecture studios, those are, you know, always going on and they often have a different theme. So we'd have to find the right studio. And Steve's right, it's not uncommon for us to have 
joint, especially landscape architecture studios with, with the architecture program, where sometimes what might happen is the architecture program, you know, tackles a problem for a semester or two, and then the landscape architects follow up after that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a single studio that works on a topic. You know, sometimes we find ways to kind of spread the work out over, um, you know, different different instructors and different studios and even, you know, over time. So we try to, we try to find ways that we can really be flexible in helping community, you know, achieve their needs. Um, like Stephen was saying, some of the other things that we have for options um, is that if it doesn't quite fit into a studio, we have had faculty that sometimes take on projects either as consultants through one of our centers. So we have three centers affiliated with our department. Um, and they're basically vehicles that allow us to do community engagement without, I'll be honest with you, sorry, Tony, without having to really go through all the bureaucracy that the university has set up for going through major grants. <laughs> you know, they're really, you know, the, the university is set up, you know, for, you know, going after NSF, NIH grants, but our department, because we are a professionally oriented program and we do a lot of projects with communities, We've had to kind of set up our own structures um, that that facilitate those kinds of arrangements. And so sometimes we have faculty that might work as a consultant and often hire students to work with them. That's kind of the advantage of them doing it as a consultant through the university is that we're allowed to hire students. Um, and sometimes they actually take on projects and might actually do it as a as a special studies class. So it's kind of like you know, a, a little mini studio that maybe they have one or two students working underneath them for credits. We've done those in the past. Um, it kind of just depends on the, the faculty member and their interest and um, the number of, you know, uh, the number of, you know, the amount of labor that's required, I think is the better way to describe it, student labor in particular. Um, we can have teams of faculty look at projects. We do that periodically as well. Um, we, and then we have, you know, um, we have students that take on for their capstones. And so Steve, Steve was talking about, um, uh, you know, they, they call them thesis projects, but for us in our department, a thesis and a project is actually two distinct things. But either way, when the students get ready to graduate, when our master's students get ready to graduate, they have to do some type of a, a final project. And that often, they're looking for a community partner to, to work on something of interest to them. And so that's another option. Um, and, you know, and again, you know, this is an educational experience for the students with the projects, they do work under faculty supervision, but not to the same intensity as, as if it was a funded um, consulting project where, you know, the client is actually paying a faculty member to be a consultant on the project and then maybe paying some money for the faculty to hire students working under them. For a project, um, you know, it's really supposed to be the students' independent work <coughs> in consultation with, with a community partner. But we do a lot of those. Um, and um, I don't know, my, I think that kind, of, that kind of hits upon, you know, the types of ways that we engage the community. Um, and like I said, there's, yeah, we're, we, we've done a lot of these. We've worked all over the Valley. Um, you know, a lot of the people that are, um, you know, active practicing planners and not just the Valley, but the entire Northeast are alum of our program. And so we have, uh, you know, so we're often, um, you know, kind of working with former students on things like studios, which is, which is kind of a nice way to kind of, you know, um, for the alum to re-engage with the department as well. So, but I'm happy to answer any other questions. Um, I've spoken briefly to a few of my faculty colleagues that might be interested in doing this. And, you know, um, and there seems to be some interest around the department. Um, you know, I think that for them, they're kind of, you know, they're they're enamored by the prospect of doing some visioning work around you know the mall and and the Route Nine corridor in general because it's kind of an iconic element of the region I think and uh, that's kind of attracted some attention but you know also you know you know that they're they're interested in things like you know 
what the scope actually is, what the timing is, and you know what what it is really that the community is interested in having done. So, so in a sense, I was kind of sent here today mostly to take notes. <laughs> <laughs> and and either Henry or Steve, I mean, just just as initial question, and then I'm I'm sure um, other committee members have a lot of questions. Can you can you what would be the uh, ask from us. I mean, obviously, it can't be such a broad, open scoped project that, you know, you wind up spinning your wheels and, and taking it in a thousand different directions. So what typically would you want to see? Um, we have an updated master plan. Um, so I'm sure there's, you know, you probably need information on zoning, things like that. I mean, can you just kind of describe how you would engage with us to get a project of this nature going? So maybe I'll start, Henry, and you can you can can you know continue. So we've done it all. We've worked where there is no scope other than an idea, and we've worked where there is a very very tight scope, and probably somewhere in between is you know um, the sweet spot. So one example that I'm thinking of right now is we did a project actually with landscape architecture, looking at the so-called gateway region or gateway district of Amherst, which is that stretch between downtown Amherst and UMass, where fraternities used to stand. Mm -hmm. In that case, the client was the bid, the business improvement district. And really they said, show us what the highest and best use of this land could be. And so forget about zoning, forget about, you know, quite frankly, forget about neighbors and just show us what the highest and best use, you know, might be. And then we've worked with a very tight scope that you know that we, you know, communities that know they have an old mill or something like that, and they know what the zoning is, they know where the resistance is, and what can we do with the mill? You know, something you know something along those lines. So somewhere in between those two. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that <laughs> that pretty accurately describes. Um, you know, my experience working with faculty and working with on, you know, community projects and working with students on community projects. Um, th there's, you know, so for our, our planning studio classes in particular, there, the instructor is really the person that, you know, works with the, the instructor works with the community client beforehand to really help identify the scope. And our, our, um, studio instructor right now is um her her name is is Camille Barshers and she you know she she used to work as a planning consultant so she has a lot of experience scoping projects and working with clients to help them basically define what it is that they really want to look at but you know obviously the the community has to come in with some you know parameters and and for for the studios um you know, again our primary goal you know aside from like kind of wanting to be involved in the community and, and get experience for our students, but there was also some particular um, pedagogical goals associated with this, with the studio. And so there's certain things that, that Dr. Barshers is going to be looking for, you know, it's like, does this studio hit upon these particular pedagogical goals? Um, and she would be the one that would be able to tell you what those are. You know, um, I think that, you know, often she likes to have things that have, you know, somewhat of an outreach or a participatory component, something that's broad enough that it isn't, it isn't such a narrow project that it, it doesn't give the students a good range of experience in planning, but also you don't want something that's so broad that there's no end point in sight because with a studio, you know, we've, what is it, 14 weeks, you know, from start to finish. And, um, you know, and we can throw quite a bit of, you know, student time and faculty time in in a very narrow time span. But at the same time, it it has to be laid out well enough so that it's doable within that time span so that the client has a good idea of what they're going to get because we don't want to set them up you know, for for a project that goes goes on and on and on and on forever because the students won't be around. Um, and but we also don't want to uh, set up expectations that we can't possibly meet. So we usually try to find projects that have some, like Steve said, it's kind of there's this sweet spot 
of for a studio project that we're kind of looking for for the type of projects that we take on and for things that don't fit within that you know or if we already have you know a, a you know a project lined up you know for studio then you know we have these other things that you know we arrange for things that are very narrow questions they make good projects for somebody's master master's degree completion for things that um you know might be done over a summer you know, then we might actually have a faculty member take that on as, as a consulting project. It just really depends. Um, there's no one size fits all for what we do. So it's hard to say exactly what it is, you know, specifically that we're looking for. Yeah. So, so one, one uh, thing I'd like to say about, you know, engaging students, and I think it was Art Linkletter that had, had the show or something like that called the Kids Say the Craziest Things. But if you engage students, and, and students basically have the I think range. Bill Cosby was the host of that, Steve. Oh, Bill, sorry. oh, I'm sorry. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll change my cultural reference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, so we've engaged in all kinds of projects that could be controversial, like the expansion of the Jones Library, you know, things like that. Um, and the, the preface is always, you know, these are students who are given the free will to expand the horizons. So this is not what will be built, but it actually might change your, it might actually change your impression of what could be built. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a huge advantage of, of getting us involved is that like, hey, we don't know any better, but hey, have you thought about four-story high, well, you know, four-story housing along Route 9, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. And if you hired a professional consultant, they'd probably be much more resistant to, they might be much more resistant to, you know, really having sort of blue sky thinking because of the, you know, because of basically the obligation of, of community involvement. But if you involve students, there's a different kind of a, you know, different kind of a, um, a bar. Mm -hmm. that is. Yeah, I think with the planning studios, they tend to start out with more of a needs assessment, and there's often a lot of kind of stakeholder involvement at the beginning. And so this kind of, you know, differs with, you know, the way that, you know, uh, you know, the landscape architecture, you know, kind of might, might go about doing a, a studio where, you know, with the planners, um, you know, one of the first things that we often do when we're first starting a project is, you know, a SWOT type of analysis, you know, where we actually work with, you know, stakeholders in the community to kind of a sense, you know, ask, you know, assess strengths, weaknesses, threats, and opportunities. I think I got the, the letters wrong. Um, and, and, you know, so, but at the same time, you know, we encourage the students, you know, um, to both, you know, kind of work with community members and understanding what their vision for the place is but also to be creative in, you know, designing different scenarios of, you know, what future uses for, for, you know, a corridor, if it's a corridor study might be, um, you know, the landscape architects, you know, they're, they're more of the designers in, in our department, the planners are, you know, they're the, um, yeah, they, they come up with kind of the more of the, the broader visions and do a lot of the outreach component. And if there's any data analysis that needs to be done, if there's any analysis, you know, an assessment of whether or not the visions um, are, you know, permitted under the current bylaws or under the current zoning, you know, that's the kind of thing that they do as well. You know, so so it's it can it can be a little bit different. But again, you know, we've we've done lots of different types of things. So it's it's. Yeah. So I did put a link to the master plan update into the chat and that has a, oh, I should introduce myself. I'm Bill DeWire. I'm the clerk of the planning board. Uh, I am in my eighth five-year <clears throat> five term on the board and I'm still third in seniority on a five-member board. So um I've been doing this for a while too, but the uh, master plan has multiple goals and subtasks towards those goals, most of which start with discuss this or discuss that. It's not an ironclad commitment to adopt anything, but um, there's basically a menu of things that we have thought worthy of attention. So it's something that uh, maybe some of your faculty can page through and say, I've always wanted to look at 
something like this. So um, we, we're not completely starting from scratch. We have a, a menu of sorts of things that we'd like to look at. So um, there's that to use as, as a starting point. Could you talk a little bit about timing? I mean, I heard you mention, you know, summer projects. Um, I mean, is that even feasible for us to do something like that? Or are we most likely looking at something for the fall fall semester? Even the fall is, there's a, the thing about universities is there's a huge lead time because we, mm -hmm. well, if it's an academic, if it's a course, we act, operate on a fall, spring. We don't really have summer courses, at least once that we have on the books that could tackle something like this. Mm -hmm. And faculty start planning what they're going to do in their courses around now. So in order to get it on the agenda, so um, our most likely studio that could address this would be a fall course. In the spring, our courses are focused on typically other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So fall would be possible. And the one of the instructors for that is you know, sort of aware of this and she couldn't join us tonight because of the conflict, but she might come on at 6.30. So, so summer, um, you know, summer, it all depends on what the context is. So summer would be funded research or something like that. So in a way it would depend on the ability of the town of Hadley to, you know, get together, you know, the funding or whatever and develop a, um, a contract that could be executed within you know, summer is upon us just next month. You know, right. we're almost up, we're almost on May. So, yeah, yeah. I think you know that's that's pretty accurate for us. You know, I mean, it depends. You know, for the summer, it's coming right up. Um, you know, we don't have. You know. Um, graduate coursework in the summer and a lot of our students, you know, already have things lined up. But if there was a faculty member, you know, if, if there was a funded research component to part of this and the faculty member wanted to do that work through our center, we can actually set those things up pretty quickly. But I'd have to, you know, I don't know who would be interested in or who has already spoken for for this summer. So I'd have to start kind of um you know, sending the information around and, and, you know, seeing if anybody is, is interested and available. And so that would require, you know, having, um, you know, some, something to, to, something to suggest, you know, like for instance, I talked to my colleague, John Mullen, who is a, you know, he's a professor emeritus now, but he's still very active in the department. And John's, you know, John was very interested in, you know, doing something related to this, um, if you if you all are interested, but you'd have to, you know, negotiate with John on you know, exactly what the scope of that kind of project would be. And then he'd have to kind of, you know, draft up a scope of work and a, and a contract. But we, you know, if there is faculty interest, they can usually do those things pretty quickly. Um, it just depends. Um, now, if for something like a studio, you know, we're right now actively, you know, right now is basically pretty close to um, when we're when we're lining up things for the fall. And so I'd need to put you in touch with Camille Barchers um, and see whether or not I'm not even sure she already has a client lined up for the fall studio this year. We usually try to plan those out in a, ahead. And again, you know, it, it um, you know, we try to, you know, we try to find interesting projects you know, for the studio, for the, you know, because that's the, the our master's students one kind of studio experience during the, um, the entire MRP program. If it was more of a landscape architecture type of studio, then, you know, again, they might be looking for things for the fall. Um, I'm not sure. I'd probably want to put you in touch with our, our chair, Robert Ryan, um, or, you know, Ethan Carr, who is the program director for landscape architecture. Because they could tell you, you know, on you know, on in that side of our department, who's looking for things, you know. So I, I can't really speak on their behalf. I'm not even sure what the, you know, what, what studios are, you know, might um, 
be going on in the fall or in the spring that that would want to do this coordinating something like an architecture land art studio um that would take a little bit longer you know just the you know while we try to be nimble you know again coordinating two uh two curricula is a little bit more complicated than just one <laughs> steve can probably attest so but but you know that could be something that you know that that might be a discussion that we kind of have going forward maybe for you know a little bit further in the future but again i'd want to refer really to to one of my landscape architecture colleagues if if that's what you're trying to do questions or thoughts from the committee all sounds promising I'm really excited about all this information and the possible collaboration with UMass. Um, you know, it's always hard. I'm, I tend to be a really. Um, Alliance yeah. with our partners is always yeah. challenging, but I, I totally get it. It it's for the long run, you know, so it's good. I'm, I'm Emma dragon. Um, I, my preferred name is dragon. I'm, I'm on the board of health. Um, and I'm a committee member, so I apologize for not introducing myself before then. Oh, no, that's okay. You. you were cutting out a little bit at the beginning, and that's why I, I was... And we miss you in Amherst. Yeah. <laughs> it was, we did a lot of great things, didn't we? Yes, yes. And I just really enjoyed our time, and I'm just so excited to be with you all again in a different yeah. capacity. So it's yeah. wonderful. Any thoughts from anybody else? Uh, so I'm Sean Barry. Uh, I'm a member of the committee, a uh, local business owner. I was actually a uh, uh, LARP uh, student from uh, 89. John Mullen Chagrin, I didn't graduate, but uh, uh, he'd be a great <laughs> asset if he was willing to... Uh, Oh, so John Mullen's the reason why he didn't graduate? Yeah, he's, he's no, a, he, he's not the reason I didn't. He, he, he I'm the reason I didn't. <laughs> we, Despite his boot in my uh, rear end, were you in? Uh, were you uh, on? Were you in LA or an RP? Just out of curiosity, LA, You're LA, in LA. But uh, I was also in the Army Reserve, so he was uh, uh, a kindred spirit. Yeah. Well, we have a, a uh, actually a fairly distinguished list of um, all but thesis or project students out there too. So absolutely, <laughs> yes. I, I still follow along uh, on, on the the goings on and who's moved on and who. You know, I'm, I'm sure I'm, we could accept a, a late project. I could process that right uh, to graduate school. Yeah. Oh, well, good to know. <laughs> Finally, get that degree. But, uh, I actually need to get going soon, um, but I, I'm i not exactly sure how to proceed. Maybe, um, I don't know if Tony had to step out for his other meeting, but um, I will put my email, I think you all have it, but I'll put it right here in the chat so that you all can get in touch with me directly if you need to. Um, you know, one of the things that I can do immediately is, you know, because, you know, we're, we're, um, you know, all the different faculty have different specialties and different interests. You know, I'm more of the kind of the numbers person in the department. I do a lot of market studies and so on and so forth. Um, John is a little bit more of a on the boots on the ground type. Um, you know, we have faculty that, you know, focus on, you know, everything from green infrastructure and environmental planning to kind of land use and, you know, zoning and so on and so forth to public participation. And, um, and everything in between, right? So, so um, you know, different faculty, you know, when they get involved in projects, often you know, there's some things that you, you know that um, that might bring more of us together, or might be completely within the domain of one particular faculty member. So, as as you all kind of, you know, um, maybe get a little bit more of a, you know, and and you know, we can look through the the master plan, but the master plan is going to cover a lot. Right. But so as you kind of start narrowing down, you know, what what you think it, you know, at least somewhat what what you might be interested in and how you think you might want to engage, you know, um, please let me know. You know, I'd be more than happy to, 
you know, refer you to my colleagues in landscape architecture as well. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're looking for something that has, you know, more of a kind of a site level and design orientation, um, you know, or, but if you're looking for something that's a little bit more kind of at the corridor level or involves, you know, kind of, um, you know, a, a larger stakeholder involvement or public participation, or even kind of like, you know, just thinking of like different scenarios, you know, um, you know, that might be more in the domain of the, the planners or, you know, or it so, involves something like, you know, oh, you need somebody that, you know, you want to run the, you know, do an economic impact or a fiscal impact analysis study. That's kind of more of my thing. Um, or, you know, a housing market feasibility study, those kind of things, you know, um, but just, you know, I'm happy to, more than happy to, you know, kind of keep the discussion going and refer you to whoever it is in, you know, our department that's going to be of, you know, the most direct and I think relevant to, to what you all are interested in. And I'll let Tony, you know, since he's back on the, you know, Tony, Tony knows how to get in touch with me too. So he can, he can, you know, continue to serve as liaison and, and um, I'll just kind of, you know, follow your lead, but Okay, Otherwise, thanks for time, um, thank you. Oh, thank you all for having me. I'm sorry I have to go, but I do have some other yeah. commitments. See you, Henry. And thank you. Yeah, have fun in DC, you. Steve. We'll see you when you get back. Okay, take care. Sean, was the was there a comment you wanted to make or a question you wanted to ask? Uh, no, I was just going to say it all depends on what we as a committee decide or what we think the town wants. Um, like you said, the studio, the, the bar is almost not existent. You can let the students go nuts and they could design, you know, Disneyland in the oh, Hampshire Mall area. Yeah. Or you can just go, <laughs> right, it's turning into an entertainment uh, facility anyways. Yeah, right. uh, or, or if we want to be more laser focused and uh, actually come up with a true policy. Uh, I think we want to be somewhere in the middle, show people what is truly possible and open their minds up and, you know, and also see that it could be worse. And you can work backwards, if I may. So like, that's really kind of how form-based code works. So um, form-based code comes up with generally what do you want the look and feel, feel to be? Mm -hmm. And then you work backwards to figure out then uh, do you what kind of zoning would you need to make that to accomplish that? Is it an overlay zoning? Is it a change to the body of the zoning? Um, do you want the within those forms? Do, how much of that do you want to be retail? How much do you want to be office? How much housing? How much other entertainment? Other uses? So that's that's a pretty typical way of working. Also, mm -hmm. so so there. Um, so we've talked about sort of funded research and studios and so forth. So there, there's a model that we work with a, a, a fair amount is in these studios, there's um, funding, you know, it's, and I had given Tony a number that when we worked for the town of Irvington, that was a studio for us. And it was about, you know, $18,000. When we worked for the town of Amherst, it was, there was a $25,000, you know, um, contract. And I think that Henry would agree that these are typical numbers for the kinds of work they do. And so just to give an idea of, and what we use those for is we use those for um, to also bring in consultants so that the expertise of the faculty and the students is fortified with people who, we, you know, we can bring in urban designers and others that we um, feel that we need to make a better studio we use it to underwrite some of the expenses that the students will be encountering. We use that to put together, you know, a publication. So when we were actually, when we worked with the bid, we put together a, what I thought was a pretty um, handsome publication that then the bid or the town of Amherst or whoever was interested in the subject could use to, you know, start talking about what the opportunities were. Okay, no, that's really helpful. I mean, obviously, you know, we're a municipality. We have no money, of course. No, of course um, not, yeah. No, but there's, there's a lot of grant opportunity out there yeah. that 
yeah. be some ways to get creative um, to fund this as well. Yeah. Anybody and also else? look at who benefits. So the benefits could be the landowners themselves or the, the adjacent landowners or, you know, the, um, you know, so there's others that could be helpful. Mm -hmm. Right. Hampshire Mall could underwrite or Pyramid, yeah. I should yep. say, could underwrite it. Mm -hmm. They would have a, a huge... portion of it. Yep. But we're, we're excited. So quite frankly, the Route 9 corridor is a dream project, right? Because every single one of us, I mean, that's our, it's the region's commercial district. And I don't think there's a single architect in the valley that hasn't dreamed of the opportunity to bring a vision to, you know, to that corridor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, um, you know, kind of when, when uh, you're just framing out, and I don't remember if it was you or Henry used the words, but, you know, even starting out with the, what's the highest and best use, right? And because we all have our paradigms about what, we think should be where and what's untouchable. And um, so it'd be interesting certainly to get uh, yeah. an outside perspective. And also, you know, from the more taking, there's so many other things from a planning standpoint that need to be taken into account that, yeah. you know, we don't, we don't have a planner. We have a, we have a planning board in town. We lean very heavily on the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, but you know, we've never undertaken, I don't think, Bill can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've ever undertaken something that might be somewhat open-ended in this way. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a, you guys have done a terrific job of concentrating your commercial development into that, you know, very, that zone. And I think that the next step is, is really what you're talking about here is to really make more housing part of that component. I mean, there's obviously some housing, the over 55 or over 50 housing that's on the bike trail, you know, place, things like that. But I, I think that as far as I know what your aspirations are or your possible aspirations are, I think this is, you know, um, really exciting and we'd love to be part of it. Okay, great. Um, any questions for Steve before we let him go? If not, I'm sure, um, we will be in touch, Steve. Okay. Uh, nice yeah. to see you all. Okay. You as well. Thank take, you for the time. Take, take care. And thank, thank you for all you. <laughs> okay. um, so I would suggest to the members of the board <clears throat> that you too take a look at the various uh, goals and steps outlined in the master plan. And um, we're talking, we're, we have a list of projects that, <clears throat> or uh, we we have uh, we have lists, and um, rather than trying to just take out a blank pad and start your own, uh, it might be helpful to look through that and see what uh, what you think would be a good priority project. We've picked out some that we've dealt with. We created an affordable housing trust fund, for example, and various steps, but. We're just picking at it a, a bit at a time, and uh, there's there's a lot there. Uh, so, more eyes on uh, setting priorities would be welcome. Yeah, I'm wondering if um, just trying to think of concrete next steps to try to move it along. Um, and I mean, obviously, we're not going to. We shouldn't go too far um, because, again, we're in a we're an appointed advisory board to the select board and, and the planning board. Um, so, I mean, I, I would certainly strongly suggest that we we at least, you know, get buy-in for, for the project. I mean, I think generally people are aware of the conversation, but we would want to formally go back to the planning board and the select board to say, hey, this is, this is what we'd like to do. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, you know, again, in terms of next steps to try to narrow that that scope. Um, you know, I kind of like that the highest and best use of the Route 9 corridor with these parameters in mind that are outlined from the from the master plan and seeing if, if there's a way for us to, to kind of narrow it that way. 
Bill? Does that make sense to you, given what's in there? Sure. I mean, I, I think before we propose anything, we need to have some foundation, and um, that's a, a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And um, we can take a look through that. As Sean was saying, what, what would the committee like to recommend? Well, we need to there's there's a list there's a menu you can uh, you know circle your uh, your top five and maybe we'll get a consensus of mm -hmm. I was thinking from the other from the other end uh, when I was recommending to the to UMass was that um, if you look through that someone, uh, some faculty member might find something they're really interested in doing. And it would be a bonus if it was also something we were interested in having done. So um, anyway, there's there's a list there. Um, and um, I can try to extract, the, it's basically about five pages that just summarize, uh, you know, next tasks type things mm -hmm. in relative priority. So I could uh, try to extract those and, and get that circulated around. Okay, thanks. That'd be hugely helpful. Emma? Bill, yeah, and Bill and Molly, would that be like great to have kind of as an action item for each of us before the next meeting? Would that be helpful? Sure, if you have the time yeah. to look through it and, and wanted to bring you, bring, jot down three three of the tasks that are outlined in the master plan that you think are more important than there are important to get done. You know, we're yeah. always looking at it too. We, not all of them are planning board action things like adopt a new bylaw. Some of them are sort of open-ended about consider priorities for something, uh, for this, that, or the other thing. But, um, you know, take a look at what's there. That The list has been done, um, and um, it will have, uh, there, there may be some things you'll like on it, or I, you'll be interested in. I love it when the major homework of a group project's already done, and it just takes a, a quick glance over, right, Molly? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but this is really helpful, but thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just suggest, because I know that what Steve was talking about with the university's uh, process, if we want to target fall semester for a student project as part of this initiative, uh, we should probably start having the conversation sooner than the next committee meeting. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, they're going to be making those decisions over the next three, four, five weeks. So it may be who of us to kind of consolidate our thoughts offline, uh, generate whatever we think the priorities are, and then share them with UMass so that they can come to the next meeting uh, to basically yay or nay it. Oh, let me tell you how many ways that's going to violate the open meeting law. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. It would Sorry. We can uh, schedule a, um, we can Another schedule meeting. a meeting anytime on yeah. basically three days notice. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So if two week, if a month is too long to go between meetings, we can have a meeting in early May. Uh, I just need to set up the Zoom. Um, I, I think that's a great proposal. So I would like to support that motion of maybe having a, a meeting in two weeks to discuss those possible action or, you know, supported tasks by our committee. Um, so that way we are in alignment with open meeting law. Um, yeah, it's so tricky. Um, you know, it can be information sharing, but not any deliberation or discussion and certainly not anything that involves a possible quorum of this group. So there's a lot of pieces within that that make it challenging. Mm -hmm. So the first week of May, we've got town meeting on the 4th. Um, well, that's not until seven. We can squeeze in a meeting. <laughs> yeah, I actually wouldn't mind squeezing in the meeting. But, um, 
Yeah, I mean, or quite frankly, we could even try to do it next week, too. And we'll, what's anybody's thought on that? I know for myself, that would be enough time to look at what's already kind of on the planning board's task list and future plans. Yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, it's almost better to strike while the iron's hot, fresh on our minds. Um, I am out of town the second half of next week, mm -hmm. but you know, Justin can be the fill in. Yeah. Or, uh, Bill, do you or have a meeting on the 25th? We do not. We had our meeting last night. So that's our, uh, second, uh, April meeting. Okay. Could folks do um, Tuesday the 25th at 6 o'clock? We'd have to post it tomorrow. I have one more schedule to check. Hold on. <laughs> I, I know for me, in terms of other obligations, 630 would be better than 6. I'm, I'm fine with 630 if that's... And, and it, this would be a single... This would be the only item on the agenda. Yeah. Right. You said the 25th? Yep. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. All right. What time on the 25th? 6.30? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and it looks like um, with the people who said they can do it so far. And, and if you can't... Um, Never mind. Um, let's plan on that, and then um, I'll make sure that that gets posted tomorrow, as long as Bill can send a, a Zoom link. Yeah, I'll do that tonight before we... Can I ask a question, Bill? The, plan, the master plan is from 2017. Is that the most updated plan? Yes. Okay. The um, basically we're supposed to do it every ten years. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, good. So we have our marching orders, and that's it for that topic. Everybody ready to move on? Okay, Bill. You want to tell us about forty R? Um. Let's see. Well, there are a couple of things in there. Hang on just a sec. Can we get back to the agenda? Um, I have no update on Econo Lodge at the moment. And I did uh, check uh, the EOCD uh, website and the affordable housing index. Uh, no, the number of uh, dwelling units that are counted into it overall is still based on the 2010 census. The data set has not been released for the 2020 census yet, but we're still over 10%, uh, so that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, 40R, uh, I'll give you, I, I'll give you a, a quick survey of it. Um, I even have a PowerPoint. I didn't make it myself. Uh, and I have sent, uh, shared it with Molly so um, she can, um, uh, she'll get it around to everybody. Mm -hmm. Just have to see where did I, oh, come on, you're right there. Uh, there it is. Okay, so I will be, uh, I will not linger on anything. Uh, this is prepared by the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, just going to go over some details. Essentially, Chapter 40R is a zoning tool that allows you to create uh, sub-districts um, that will encourage housing in your community. And 
It differs from ordinary zoning in that uh, these districts can be um, created with a simple majority instead of the two thirds majority that is required for most zoning changes. Uh, there is an affordable component in, uh, required in it and there is money uh, back to communities that participate in the program. And uh, okay, I'm not, I, I really wish I had been at the seminar that explained this because I'd like to see how they uh, described uh, what's going on. Um, but the eligible components are near transit stops. We don't really have any that really matter uh, except some bus stops, but areas of concerted, concentrated development and highly suitable locations. So something like the uh, Connell Lodge or basically anything else along Route 9 probably falls into the category of a highly suitable location. Um, it increases the density of what is allowed in the district and the denser you allow it to be, the um, the more money you stand to get. There's a procedure for getting there. Uh, one thing that puts us ahead of the game is that we already have just adopted a housing production plan uh, this year. So uh, we have um, a, uh, we're in better standing. Some of the requirements for the application, uh, Basically, it has to be almost as upright. We can have a design review component. Um, and uh, again, this is part of uh, the rest of it just is who has adopted it, uh, the districts that have been approved, the number of units that have been approved within these districts. You can see in our area, Northampton, East Hampton, um, Holyoke, have all worked on 40R districts or are working on it. Um, so it's pretty broadly circulated around the state, obviously denser in the greater Boston area where you have more transit stops. And I think that's about the, um, <clears throat> that's about all we have to go through from this PowerPoint presentation. Again, uh, uh, Molly will send it around so you'll all have access to it. So we're planning board has been talking about the possibility of adopting a 40R as an alternative to the unsuccessful friendly 40B petition. Uh, it's not a short-term fix. The uh, background material at um, the state indicates that from start to finish, it can take about a year to get something approved, but um, it is a way to get some, uh, to be able to really fine tune the, um, the housing requirements and what will, how things will be allowed without opening an entire district. So we don't have to say, since we only have one business district from the bridge to the Amherst town line, we don't have to add multiple dwellings as an allowable use in the district, we can uh, create a sub district that might consist of uh, the land, you know, the the acreage centered on the Hampshire Mall and centered on the Mountain Farms Mall, um, without going any further. So we'll uh, continue to explore. We'll be talking about it again next uh, in uh, May second at our next planning board meeting with our consultants from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Anyone's welcome to attend. The uh, Zoom will be in the uh, agenda. So Bill, theoretically, um, let's say like we, we wind up moving forward with the university and the, with whatever this visioning project, um, whatever form it takes and they come back and then there's some ideas that we really like. This could be part of the solution to implementation as well, right? It could. 
Uh, you could also approach it from the uh, the other side, which is to ask to for uh, identify identify likely Chapter Forty R eligible sites. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, I can just offer a few extra thoughts. I've done a lot of work with 40B and some work with 40R, but um, I actually was having a conversation with a member of the planning board in Northampton uh, the other day and asking them how they've been applying it. They've been using it more like spot zoning on a project by project basis. And um, DHCD recently raised the flag and said, you're the only community doing it this way and doesn't really align with the intent. So if the intent here is to use it you know, to facilitate the Econolodge renovation, uh, I think DHCD is looking at it more as a district than a, a site-based initiative. Um, I'd also suggest we look at, uh, I think it's called compact neighborhood policy or something like that. There's an additional component to this that they added after the fact. Uh, it adds a couple other criteria, I think more affordability, but then offers additional incentives on top of what the program offers. So there's sort of another layer we can explore for higher density, more affordability. The one warning I want to raise about increasing density is that um, we have limited sewer coverage and somewhat limited sewer capacity. There are bright options for sewer capacity, but um, the fact is that the pipes don't go everywhere. So as you drive by a piece of property, oh, like the, uh, <clears throat> the Rocky Hill Road and North Maple Street, and uh, there's no sewer there. Their, their proposal would require them to spend a lot of money to extend a sewer line to the Amherst uh, sewer treatment plant. Um, so when we're talking about something like compact neighborhoods, we're often thinking that the housing portion of Hadley is off of Route 9, but if it if there's no sewer there, um, septic on small lots is uh, really iffy. I mean, it can be done, but um, if, if the first system fails, you don't necessarily have a lot of options to put a replacement system in if you have a small lot. So just something we're mindful of. Yeah, and we're still, the project with Amherst continues to move forward um, in terms of the uh, engineering design around uh, finding a way to hook in, hook into uh, their system to help with the capacity. But as Bill said, that's a very limited area at the moment. Uh, our, our consultant at Pioneer Valley Planning Commission did reach out to uh, the state and specifically was talking about how small a parcel could be a 40B district. Um, and the answer it came back was it depends. And, and yes, I understand that they, they do want it somewhat larger, but it's, it, this is just such a unique project that we might be able to swing it for 50 affordable units in an existing structure, um, in an existing developed area. Um, but, Having said that, if we're going to think about it, using it as a tool, we might want to do something larger, like the portion of the industrial district that is occupied by uh, Mountain Farms Mall and the Chinese Immersion Charter School as well, um, just to create another option for mm -hmm. a future there. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions for for? Bill on that, um, and I'll get that PowerPoint around, and there's there are a couple of other links, too. There's plenty of really good information, so if people want to try to become more educated, I know there are always nuances about it, um, we can provide the resources. Yeah, for there are a lot of links at the uh, DHCD webpage, and I downloaded only two products, one that PowerPoint and one a, uh, a summary that is kind of dated because it talks about a two-thirds majority of uh, town meeting vote, but it, that's been changed to a uh, simple majority. Mm -hmm. Because we've had projects where we have not been able to get even a simple majority to support a zoning change. So nothing mm -hmm. is guaranteed. Nope. 
I think we've all been to those town meetings. Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda, potential projects. I just wanted to provide a quick recap just because these were some of the things that had come in front of us. Um, we had the proposal from Trinitas. Um, that's the parcel that Bill was referring to a short while ago. Um, they were the developers who were interested in getting feedback on the possibility of developing, um, I think the proposal was 270 or so units um, off of Rocky Hill Road, um, the farmland that's kind of tucked behind Hawks Meadow and runs a alongside 116 and then backs up on the uh, Venture Way Park. Um, so uh, Tom Reedy, the, their attorney was in touch. Um, and I think that they're evaluating whether or not they want to uh, continue to try to push forward with that project. Um, and we're contemplating doing a survey of the neighbors to see you know, what, what sort of feelings folks would have about, about that, just so that they could bring more, more data to the table if they um, choose to come back. And then also uh, wanted to mention that the Palmers uh, who own the uh, Hampton Inn and the Hadley Village Barn Shops, that area, uh, they're interested in doing something different with that Village Barn area. And I know that they went in front of the uh, planning board um, just to, to talk a little bit about that. And they're interested in getting out of uh, one of our future agendas as well. So that would be, I think, Kishore Palmer. Um, wanted to let us know what they're thinking to get our thoughts on that. Okay, so just uh, see when they want to come to the table. I think he's on on vacation because it's school vacation week this week. Um, then the next item. So I always phrase this as this is just a question, <laughs> but there. Is, as I think we're all aware, there are a lot of different committees and groups, so formal or informal in town, who are very interested in uh, having conversations around housing. So uh, it's an area of focus for the Age Dementia Friendly Committee um, that's you know primarily focused on the seniors. There's uh, the DEI Committee um, has been having conversations about it. And uh, obviously our committee. And then there's kind of an informal group of, of folks who uh, weren't happy with, with the way that the um, ZBA ruling went uh, regarding the O'Connell Lodge. Um, so that certainly provoked a lot of more, I'll call them more private conversations, but in a, in a group way um, about what's going on with housing. And what I've certainly noticed at the, there's a huge cry for information because people are becoming more and more aware and wanting to be involved. Um, some of them much later to the, the game than others. And there's also an awful lot of misinformation floating around. So I was pondering whether or not our committee, since we're sanctioned as the, the housing, housing and Economic Development Committee, would be interested in um, thinking about some sort of an open forum um, that anybody could come to, to to just to learn more about this type of thing. So there's just something I'm throwing out there. I mean, I, I think it's a good idea, uh, especially in the context of the 40R conversation and um, you know, the UMass project, getting some voices would be helpful in hearing what people are actually thinking about how Hadley's housing development practices and um, asking questions of the town about how those practices are put in place. I think it'd be useful. That's covering a lot of ground. <clears throat> Were you thinking primarily of a... Uh, um, uh, just a meeting of boards to sort of co coordinate our approach, or is this a public forum? Um, I mean, it just seems like it could go in a lot of a lot of different directions. Yeah, I mean, we you know we certainly wouldn't want.
want anything to, to be, you know, create a free for all. Um, so there would have to be, you know, kind of guardrails put on it. Um, and my thought was that it would be public, uh, but, you know, Bill, I'm thinking about, I'm trying to think, was it, uh, yeah, I think it was the DEI committee <clears throat> that a, a long time ago, like well over a year ago, asked me to come and speak to them. And I said, well, you, you know, Bill Dwyer's a far, far more knowledgeable than I am. And, and you and I um, attended that meeting and there were a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about something more along those lines. Okay. Um, and I know that group Hadley Hadley Reads or something like that. They were interested in very interested in housing issues at one point. Yeah, so Hadley it's Hadley Learns. Yeah, Hadley they're definitely Learns. one of the groups I was talking about. Um, yeah, I mean we'd we'd have to think through content and the like, but I I again I just think there's a cry for information, and and obviously our group couldn't do anything without it. Going back to um, the select board, we need to approve that before we. We convened anything, but I I think that you probably need to have a more of a plan before we do that right away. I think that if you really do it right now, all you're going to do is just um, you're going to get you know a good a good portion. It's and it's all about a particular project. Mm -hmm. I think you need to look at have more of a plan and look at the whole thing. Like where would where do people, you know, you can have a, a discussion and it's not just on one project, but where are you thinking the housing? What are you going to do about the sewer? What are what is the vision of our business and our retail? Where is, you know, and of course I would always bring up where about the let's talk about the money and the funding and mm -hmm. and What's it going to cost us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, um, I certainly wasn't thinking about anything in the near term. I, you know, was thinking like more, you know, July, August sort of thing. Um, but I'm throwing it out here because I, I thought, you know, in terms of coming up with something, uh, I would think that this this group would would. I guess I'm asking, is this something that we would be interested in taking on? And then we would have collective input on this before we push forward with it. Meaning it's, agree. it's not just me putting together a meeting. I mean, I would want it to be the committee. I agree with you, Molly. There are a lot of questions from Had Learns in regards to the projects that we have been speaking on, the Econo Lodge and so forth, and a forum or some sort of um, place where everyone can have their questions answered, not, not more so relative to pricing and, and so forth, but just basic questions instead of, you know, leaving someone in the dark to more or less calm the people, you know. Yeah, I think it's something we definitely need to do. I just don't know if it's too soon, if we need to have more answers to those questions. But it's definitely something that should be in our purview. Okay. Yeah, so maybe it's something that, you know, we I just ask everybody to kind of think about it, let it percolate, rattle around in your head. <laughs> what you think might be helpful and not not harmful. Right. Because, again, we don't want to it, it's not to provoke anything. It's to just give people basic information so that um, they understand where we're at, that not even necessarily where we think we're going. because we don't know where we're going yet. But, you know, kind of where are we at right now, um, I think would be helpful to to a lot of people. So, OK. Right. So we'll, we'll uh, keep that on as an agenda item for future discussion. Um, I'm not aware of any unforeseen items at the time of the posting, so unless anybody else is. No? No. Okay. 
All right, so everybody's got their homework. Um, we'll post a meeting and hopefully it won't be extremely long um, for next Tuesday. 6.30 is great. I get out of work at six o'clock. That's why I'm a little bit late when I come to the meetings. I try my best to make it on time, but 6.30 is perfect. Okay, good. All right, well then thanks everybody. Have a nice weekend and we'll see you Tuesday.